everybody working? Hey, everybody. Okay. Um, Hello. <laughs> thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, we're very excited that you decided to join our level, uh, our truly great level design panel. Um, I'm Brad Merritt. I'm the moderator. I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves and talk. I want you guys to introduce yourself, uh, your company, and uh, just the kind of work you do and the kind of level design you do, whether, you know, 2D, 3D, action, narrative, um, or anything else like that you want to talk about. All right. Uh, I'm Matt Kanai. I'm a level designer at Hi-Rez Studios, and also we co-level design on for Impact Games, our indie studio. And it's both focused on multiplayer level design. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Connor, and like he said, I work for Impact Games. It's a local indie studio, and I'm one of the level designers for them as well. And uh, yeah, we're an action-based game. Uh, I'm Nathan Canuck. I'm the content director for Binary Spark Studios and uh, game designer, writer, level designer for Handyman Studios. And before that, I was a level designer and a writer for CCP Games. And before that, I was a level designer and a writer for High res Studios. And uh, okay, that's all my time. That's uh, oh, and I'm Brad Merritt. I work for Cartoon Network. Um, I do a lot of level design for uh, like flash games and mobile games and also larger uh, multiplayer games. Um, so I think the first thing that uh, we'll talk about is talk about a little bit of, you know, your process. Like, what, how do you get started? Like, what do you, what do you do? What are your first steps in making something really great? I'll go, so I'll, I'll go you, first. You guys go whichever you want. Uh, so how I've always encountered it, there's two sort of schools for getting started with level design. You start with a paper prototype, or there's the other kind of more 3D-oriented brain that just wants to dig right into the engine and start cobbling together pieces or working with BSP or, or whatever you have at your disposal. I'm very much a in-the-engine type of person. I have no artistic ability at all. It's actually a, a, usually a point of humor where I work, like stick figure drawings and really embarrassing things. Like I have a two-and-a-half-year-old son who probably draws better than me. At this point, on the other hand, I grew up with uh, with Legos, just tons and tons of Legos as a kid. And all through school, I was working on AutoCAD. And you know, this is up in Detroit, where everybody works in the auto industry. So, you know, I grew up with 3D modeling software. So when they sat me down in front of uh, like Unreal or or 3D Studio Max or Maya or something, it was just like, you know, you either have that 3D brain or you have a 2D brain. And uh, so for me, it's easier to just jump in the editor and just start sort of sort of riffing around and seeing what works. Um, I am actually the other end. I like to start off with paper prototyping. Uh, I like to do a lot of detailed drawings and maps of different areas of the level I'm working on and how I think players will proceed through that. And then I will jump right into the editor and start building out with BSP or any other 3D objects to start confirming uh, what I've drawn. Yeah, I think it's, I do kind of both approaches depending on which game I'm working on. At high res, we, it's very mandated on kind of the game mode or the, the game that we're working on. And there's kind of parameters set around that. Since it's a lot of esports and competitive nature, it's usually pretty, I guess, limited parameters in terms of, you know, having a symmetrical map because it has to be, everything has to be just even. So the pros don't be like, oh, this, this base is one inch closer than the other one. We have an advantage. Um, on Hanukkah, we're, we like to go more on paper um, and do flow maps and figure out kind of, all right, it's for this game mode, we know the rules, let's try to figure out a basic flow and then expand from there. Yeah. Um, I'd say uh, I start, and I mean, it of course, it depends on the kind of game you're working on. Um, if you're working on like a single map multiplayer game uh, kind of thing, I definitely work uh, paper first, um, long before engine work. Um, but I've also I've worked on a lot of uh, like platformer kind of games, and so when I, whenever I start with that, what I do is I I work hyper micro, where I sort of design out what are going to be what I often call magic moments, um, you know, like what is like literally two seconds of gameplay. You know, oh, I'm going to backflip over this enemy and throw a saw blade and cut him in half and land in the middle and then throw his two body parts at two other enemies. Right, like that's the magic moment <laughs> I want to do. Like I'll design something for that, but then um, I also design hyper macro where where are you gonna 
introduce different systems and mechanics throughout the, the greater flow across 20 levels or 50 levels or whatever. And then I just kind of work in between those, those two as I go. Um, so yeah, anything else to add? Well, I'll add, uh, I like what you said about magic moments. I, I do kind of the same thing on a, on a little bit larger scale. I call them uh, like nuggets of content. I, I come from a writing background, so whenever I approach level design, it's always from a, a narrative perspective. How am I advancing the story in this part? Or how am I making the player feel? Do I want them to feel claustrophobic? Or like they're in charge of the situation? Or they're helpless? So when I design a whole level, I like to say, all right, what, what is my nugget of gameplay here? And when we were on, uh, when we were back at CCP on World of Darkness, the nugget of gameplay was, I'm a vampire, I'm up on the rooftop, I wanna look down on my prey down in the streets below, sort of swoop down, get my resources out of them, and then you know vanish back into an alley or the back to the rooftops or something. So that was sort of a, not a, I mean, a core loop is like your whole gameplay experience. It was sort of like a micro loop of like, what is my, what is my moment to moment nugget where I've experienced you know, one fun little loop of, uh, of moment to moment gameplay. And then once I decide what that is, or, or if that's decided for me by a game designer, I'll just say, all right, I'm just gonna make a map full of these things, right? Make big ones and small ones, and ones that are hard to find and ones that are impossible to avoid and just fill the map with as many of those as possible. And uh, just sort of, you don't even have to lead the player from one. I mean, World of Darkness was gonna be a big open world game, so there was no leading the player around or sh showing objectives on the map or anything. It was more like a, like a Fallout or an Elder Scrolls game where, hey, if you just walk in one direction, I want you to constantly be stumbling into these things or see one on the horizon or want to jump down into one you see in a, in a, a valley or an alleyway or something. So, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a granular way to assemble things together, kind of modular, but uh, it almost worked. <laughs> <laughs> So you were talking about, you know, storytelling and narrative through game design, and you, you even talked about, you know, some emotions. Do, do you ever plot out, like, you want, you know, it's kind of like in the flow of game, right? You mm -hmm. want an action, you want a lull. You want yeah. some action, you want a lull. Do you do that same thing with emotions in games, right? You don't, people want, you don't want people to be scared, like, 100% of the time. So no, I, well, and, and in some games, you don't want people to be scared at all, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you... You, a cartoon right. network. Yeah, you, no one's ever. By the way, your right. example of like chopping someone in half and everything. Like, yeah. <laughs> it would be very cartoony, right? Like coming soon from Cartoon <laughs> Network. <laughs> Bisector. Yeah. No, like, you're, you're, think about it very Bugs Bunny esque. Right? Okay. Okay. That's that's not where my brain goes. I don't, I don't know that's about. Because you worked on World of Darkness. Right? Saw blade <laughs> chopping people. Anyway, what was the question? Okay, so obviously when you when you look at it, level design from a narrative standpoint, you might have a segment of a story that you're telling in a level that you're going through and uh, you have to get the player from A to B in that level. They have, there's a certain boss they have to fight, there's an NPC who's going to die along the way, or there's a, there's a spot where they have to stop in the middle and, and you know watch the avalanche happen or the building blow up or something. There's some scripted thing that has to happen that's part of the story. So you're constrained. Those are the your, your pegs that are down that you have to hit. And then other times, especially in like multiplayer maps, you'll have sort of an overall mood that you want to put the player in. And uh, I use this example all the time. My wife is very messy, right? So we have, <laughs> we, we have like messy stuff all over. Like, you know, she collects things and everything. And I'm always saying, you know, this is one of the tenets of, of feng shui, right? Is that you don't want to sort of simplify your lifestyle and, and put things where you can get at them easily and you don't want to have clutter everywhere because, because your brain is tracking all this clutter, right? You might, I might not be thinking about exactly where all this trash is that someone left on the table here. It's a lot like home, but uh, but my brain is, right? I've looked at it, I've moved it, and my brain is sort of keeping track of all that stuff and all the faces out there looking at me and what everything that's going on. And the more that stuff that builds up in, in sort of your brain RAM, uh, you, get, you get tense, you get nervous and agitated and, and things are jumpy. It's why uh, whenever they make a video game about like Vietnam or something, it's always jungly you know there's leaves moving and there's you know little shadows and what was that it's it's you they want you to feel uncomfortable to contrast that whenever they want you to feel like things are easy to understand and you're sort of in control of the situation they minimize all that crap try to think of the last game that you played that had uh like the desert level right where you're 
out in like the wide desert, you're playing Journey or something like that, right? You're, you're in control of that situation. You're exploring. You want to see what's over the hill. You're in control. You're not worried about all the little junk and crap and clutter and all the things that your, your brain is remembering. So that's an easy way to sort of to run the spectrum between do I, when I walk through the door, do I instantly understand this room or do I walk through the door and I'm, and I'm sort of taken aback by all, this things, all these things that I'm unconsciously logging, all this clutter that I'm putting, putting in my little library there that I have to remember. That's interesting. Hmm? So, you can, so you can make clutter to make people uncomfortable. Yeah, I think that's why my wife does it. Just, just, just like level you? designing my life. <laughs> All right, do you guys have anything to add? Um, like we try to do the same thing a lot in our maps for the multiplayer. It is, we are lacking a large part of narrative for mm -hmm. like single player games. So mm -hmm. we do have to focus on creating emotional attachments with the world space. So uh, for example, we, we do use a lot of clutter sometimes mm -hmm. to put people in a panicky mode. Mm -hmm or something like narrow spaces, yep. something that might make you confined or feel claustrophobic, as opposed to really serene open spaces. Um, that's a big thing for us, putting you in the right mindset um, to help enhance the game flow or the type of gameplay that we're looking for in a map. So I, I love the clutter example, because <laughs> I go through that sometimes too. <laughs> it works like gangbusters too, yeah. like, try it, it's crazy. And uh, working at Cartoon Network, we have a sort of a, like a different take on sort of clutter mm. and minimizing things in the world, which is we're working with a brand and, and we have fans that we want to satisfy. And so um, we have to work on these levels sometimes of, we put something really, really apparent in the game, like something you would definitely know. Like if you're playing Adventure Time, look, there's Jake the dog. Everybody knows Jake the dog, yay. Um, but we also purposely put things in the games that are very obscure and that, uh, invokes emotions in people where like when they get it it's like if you don't get it it has no effect on you but when you get it it makes you feel uh like a really hardcore fan right like you're you're better than those other fans because they don't get it right and so and we but the the great thing is right you feel that way but you probably didn't get some other deep dive like even deeper dive that's mm -hmm. behind it so um we you know, try trademark to trademark clutter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but but I mean, it's 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 meaningful in a way mm -hmm. to let people like dive deeper into the brand and feel like bigger fans and kind of feel superior to to people. Um, it's great. I love watching the uh, like um actually arguments people have on the internet about mm -hmm. things in the game. You know, where it's like. <laughs> Uh, Marceline's wearing this dress that was from this episode. I'd be like, um, actually, she first wore it in this episode, you know, and so you can tell because she's holding an umbrella. It's totally different, and so. Uh, but I mean, that's the, like players love that stuff uh, from a, from a brand perspective. So, um, so you talked a little bit about in encounters, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's a billion levels to layer design, but I think two of the really big ones are. There's the level, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the encounters, and not just the encounters, but how you distribute items and weapons and power-ups and all these things through the levels. Like, do you all have a, any methods or, or sort of tried and true procedures that you use for that? I think for, for multiplayer, it, since it's not really encounters, it's dynamic and all the players are moving around. We try to establish, you know, the, of course, the key areas where we want to drive all the players mm -hmm. with using lighting or navigation points in the level or landmarks where you have something you know it's the classic you know tower in the distance that you're trying to mm -hmm. get to kind of thing on a smaller scale though where you might have you know a really nice bridge or a really nice tree that just looks drastically different or more impactful than the rest maybe it has a little more detail so you're like oh I wonder what's over there and then we use that to kind of steer people towards the thing we want them to do if it's oh the objective just happens to be right here or oh there's falling petals you can heal right here <laughs> uh or just whatever the there's a waterfall okay we want people to go here and battle and have this cool kind of backdrop while they're dueling on a bridge um well actually one of the things about our game is it is slightly historically accurate so just from a little Easter egg perspective. Does it say that on the box? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> slightly, 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 yeah, slightly. It will say a different rendition. Yeah. But, um, and there's Abe Lincoln on a T-Rex. So. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, um, slightly. Crossbow. Yeah. Kind, kind of talking accurate. earlier where, where you said you'll, you'll add in these, these little pieces and, and fans of you know, the particular genre will sometimes get stuff. 
as far as level design for this particular game, if it takes place in a certain area that is that is a known area, sometimes we'll try to create certain spaces or use certain monuments that had real real actionable items take place there or real events and then kind of recreate that scene on a much smaller level hmm. so that if you are a super huge fan of that mm -hmm. genre like say Japanese history uh, you might be super excited to be like we're here and this is kind of what's happening this was a game changer in real life so just on a small mm -hmm. level sometimes we try to do stuff like that That's cool. so do, do you feature sort of like those historically significant like items and like you know like sword names and things like that too uh, we have tried to place some of that into the game <clears throat> where it can go, as well as some of the actual places that the game, our particular maps are being built around. Um, I really try to find geographical locations that somewhat match what we were looking for that are real places, so I could possibly pull some real item monuments or um, assets or just the scenery, like some of the flora and stuff, so you could really actually maybe, if you know that much, you'd be like, oh, okay. I really am in this this section of the world, or I really am in this region. Yeah, cool. like there's uh, one of our levels. There's we kind of charted everything. We t we opened a map of Japan and just charted where all of our maps actually would exist. Okay. And some of that's based on mood. So one, it's supposed to have an extremely serene kind of mood. So we put it just like right in Mount Yari, which is a really noticeable mountain. Cause it, the, it's called that because it's what spear is, and the the peak looks like a spear. So we made that backdrop in the scene. So you're like, oh, it's Mount Yari right there. And nice. It's a historical location, but it's not. It's not like we're. It's not like we're charting out <laughs> right, right. like a topographical map that we exported from right. NASA or something. We're like, it's like exactly to the detail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? uh, just on uh, you, you were mentioning uh, about uh, objective placement and stuff. Uh, I remember one of the one of the things we did on Global Agenda a lot way back in the day was. Uh, the objectives had sort of a, a rock, paper, scissors layout of how you would approach or defend them. So like the objective was usually like the, like a circle, you know, like a Team Fortress 2 style <coughs> stand in the circle to capture it. And so that was that was like, you know, the rock. That's where you mm -hmm. wanted to be. And then the paper was, oh, well, now it's, this is, it's all in a building and there's a balcony around it. So you've got high ground on it. So that's like a killing zone, right? So you want to try to take the balcony before you try to control the objective or you'll just get slaughtered. But then the scissors was, there was also like a big hole in the roof too on a lot of the maps. So it was like, you know, if you got up on top of the roof, you were the farthest from the objective, but you could just mow down the people on the balcony and the people on the balcony could mow down the people on the objective. But if nobody was on the objective, it was kind of useless because nobody was capturing anyway. So it was like, every time you would go in there, it would be like, oh. It was like a little miniature game of chess between the two teams. You know, what are they going to do? Are they going to be on the balcony? Are they going to try to defend the roof? Are they just going to turtle up on the objective? How are we going to do this? But, but really, those were the only three options. It's not like it was a big, wide open map and you could come from any sort of angle. Mm -hmm. We just sort of funneled people in. You know, you go on rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. I think that's, you know, you try to design levels in such a way that people, they can feel like they can do almost anything, right? But you're really funneling them into a few good decisions right you mm -hmm. want to you want to make players feel like they're being smart and they're making good decisions by doing exactly what they're yeah. supposed look to do look at the sniper tower i found <laughs> yeah. yes you did yeah exactly like, look oh, you can see the objective from level here. designer never thought this would be a sniper tower yeah conveniently placed <laughs> hiding spot yeah. Right over there yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that's uh it's certainly i mean so much of level de design or even game design is just making players feel like they're the first person to figure it out. The illusion of choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that reminds me of uh, doing level design for tribes. Those tribes guys are like, yeah. <laughs> they'll, you'll put a rock at a level just in the corner somewhere, and they'll figure, all right, if I ski at this at 300 miles per hour and yeah. I hit this corner just right, it'll ricochet me off right into the flag stand. And <laughs> as a designer, you don't plan that at all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just it's you, almost out of the map. You, you don't you admit that out. you didn't plan it. <laughs> yeah. like, ah, like, like, did you, you figured it out? Like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That was just for you. Try, you. Yeah. You, try your you try your best. <laughs> yeah. I, with the rock, paper, scissors, we, we have tons of fun conversations just sitting there going, okay, if I put a guy here, and this guy goes here, and then we could do this, yeah. and then you're like, all right, I figured out at least five, three to five scenarios, this works, and then yeah, you get the, the guy yeah. who just comes up with something completely different. Yeah. There's always that, that Counter-Strike guy who's figured out if he stands here on this barrel, he can see between these two buildings right at the enemy spawn with the sniper rifle. And then it's just that, that, that one guy, like always there. Oh, come on. So, so yeah, I mean, players definitely do unexpected things. Like, what, 
what steps in the past have you taken to find when those things happen and deal with them? Play testing. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of play testing. I mean, do do you bring other people in to play test or just your uh, your group, like internal and external, or how do you do handle play tests? I think it's a mixture. Usually yeah. we have devs in there and some outside people too, some fans or friends or whatnot. And usually the friends they'll find just crazy. Mm-hmm. They always, you know, they're like, "Hey, I'm under the map, floating, and I'm, I'm <laughs> fighting the clouds or something." And you're like, "But I put collision around everything." Yeah. Like, no, you did it. Yeah. <laughs> not on, not on that one rock. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? No, you you definitely got to have like you'll you'll test it in house, and you think you're pretty smart people, but you're not. You're, <laughs> you're not. You're not as smart as the the ten thousand people who are going to go out there and and play it and find every tiny little. But you know what? Uh, unless it's a really bad exploit, like unless you're losing a lot of your level's feel or the balance is just just being completely demolished, um, a lot of times we'll just let that stuff go. Like you found the one rock that you, if you hit it at exactly the right angle and it'll put you right on the flag, if that's a really difficult thing to do, screw it, leave it in. You know, that's, that's, like, the, that's like the trick shot, you know? <laughs> if somebody can pull that off, that's like the... Uh, the Blurns ball, you know, hit the ball here to win the game. <laughs> like, that's a one in a million thing. If yeah. somebody does that, we should be like, wow, are you kidding me? That's amazing. We shouldn't be like, no, no, yeah. oh, and, take and, that out. And what's interesting, too, is like meta balance things can happen around that, right? So, like, somebody figures out that you can ski that one rock to jump mm-hmm. to the flag. Well, then all the sti- snipers start watching that rock. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so now when you go to ski that rock, that's an idiot move. You're going to yeah. get sniped immediately, mm-hmm. right? And so, Sometimes those balance issues just get taken care of mm-hmm. that way. I know um, we definitely use a lot of play testers, and I'll it, anytime you can videotape someone play testing, do it. It'll always be better than them telling you what happened. Um, I know we see a lot of times when people tell us what happened. That's that's not what happened, mm-hmm. right? And so if you have a video of them playing, just just their screen, right? You don't have to videotape them. Videotaping them is cool too. But um, <laughs> getting the screen, well, it makes you feel good, right? Like if people are having fun, you just watch that every morning before you <laughs> um, But yeah, getting, getting videos of people playing it. But we use like data sometimes too. Um, I know we, we had a multiplayer game and we were just noticing people on one side were winning a little more often than others. And it turned out some... Uh, some enemies in like these little jungle camps had the wrong amount of health and it made like enough of a difference to skew mm-hmm. and it, it, it was a bug right it, but um but yeah we've definitely had people jumping outside of collision and annoying things like that too that that's good um have y'all ever done heat maps mm-hmm. on any of your stuff so oh, awesome. heat maps are great like generally what you do the easiest way to do it is like when someone dies you just make an xy coordinate xyz coordinate of where they died, and then it'll overlay it on the map, and wherever people have died more, it's more red, right? So, um, if you see a bunch of red, like, mm-hmm. outside of your level, you know, because yeah. hopefully you're smart <laughs> enough if someone gets out of the side of your level, they die. Um, and you're like, oh, look, all these people are dying outside the level somehow, and so uh, it helps you find things like that, too. Um, so, we talked a little bit about, um, like, planning things out what kind of steps do you take uh for um level design and how level design interacts with sort of like core game mechanics oh that's a great question so i'm thinking about like just all the all the different games because it's there's so many differences it's you look at like smite mechanics for example you're on the ground there's no z-axis it's all forward and you're basically it's kind of theme park design in a way you have you have you know you have to have your three lanes your your tower two towers in each lane your phoenix all that stuff but then you have tribes where it's basically you're taking a purlin noise terrain and then tweaking hills hoping that skiing works and it's more open and then single player platformer it's a completely different approach Mm -hmm. yeah well, you have to take everything into account, right? When we were working on uh, on Dust 514, we were doing some levels for that briefly in it, in Atlanta, and uh, they they would radically change the design from time to time, like reload times, the ranges on some of the core weapons, uh, how fast everybody could run, and they were 
they were a little bit confused because we would we would build these maps. You know, Dust 514 is a very like Halo Battlefield 2142 style sci-fi shooter, and uh, you know we would have these things mapped out where. All right, this is how fast my soldier can run. This is my reload time. So this is about how much cover I need in a map to, you know, make it so you're not constantly panicking as you as you run from from crate to crate, and then run speed would change or reload time would increase or suddenly this gun would have half the bullets it had before, and then it was like, oh, well now this level feels claustrophobic, and it was like, well yeah, you changed all this stuff, so now I gotta I gotta refactor the thing. So it's uh, you're kind of working for the game designers in that capacity. I mean, whatever decisions they make about, you know, how high a character can jump, you know, how much fall damage or how far you could fall before you start taking damage or how much fall damage will kill you. I mean, you might have a level that just suddenly becomes, you know, invalid. We had that back in Global Agenda all the time when uh, when when uh, mantling got changed around. You know, you run up to a wall, you can grab the edge, and we used to have like the shimmying thing and going around corners and all that, and then that was taken out at one point. Oh, wow. And then it was like, oh, okay, well, now you can't physically get through this map anymore. All right, I got to put some stuff to jump on here or there. And then, you know, they changed it again, and then they changed the height of it. And uh, we had one map that, at least the prototype of it, that, uh, that Scott built was uh, built entirely out of, um, like, shipping crates, you know, like the big semi-trailer-sized <laughs> shipping crates. And it was just the norm. And it, you just used it as, like, a really fast blockout method, right? I built this whole map and then like jump height changed and then like mantling we tried without mantling we tried it with mantling again and like this map over the course of just a couple of weeks went from like man this is a really solid map to this map doesn't work at all i can't get over any of these crates to man this map feels really small maybe we need more crates in it like it was just and boop and it just and the map didn't change during all that time it was just the the core part nuts and bolts of the game design that changed but so you just have to constantly be aware of all that and make sure that there is that open line of communication. Nobody can go in and just like, oh, I got three of you guys working on maps. I'm just gonna I'm gonna change jump height over here from a from a two to a 1.25, and you know hope hope Did everything works, guys. Yeah, hope, <laughs> I hope it all works. Um, we actually decided to create one map that's kind of like our test ground map. But anytime that we kind of have mechanics that we want to work through or just see how they would work, we just throw them in there. So. Not everything in that map always works together, but we have sections where we're testing out certain game mechanics, and we can we look at that and we tweak it. And then when I start designing other maps, I already remember when we were play testing how those mechanics were were kind of working. So when we're tweaking out um, jump height mm -hmm. or how far people can shoot like bows and arrows or any other mechanics like blowing stuff up, catching things on fire, so on and so forth, we just kind of have a, a fun little playground area. And then take that data and when I'm designing the next map, I go, okay, yeah, he can actually shoot that far. So I know things need to be a certain distance away or, mm -hmm. um, you know, objects need to be so high so that we're not plopping over them and getting the spaces we're not supposed to, so on and so forth. Yeah, we had that on World of Darkness, too. We had the, uh, the gymnasium, the acrobatics thing. I forget what it was called. It was some kind of gymnasium level we had. And it was like... All right, here's a one-story building, a two-story building, a three-story building. Here's a here's a fence that's almost weight height, waist height. One that is waist. One's a little bit taller. One that's twice as tall as a character. And they they were just sort of all lined up like they were at like a Home Depot or something. We said like all these all these objects of various <laughs> sizes. Home Depot. Yeah, it was and it was all it was all just like wide open white space. It was like the most boring Neo. Like they go into the Matrix and Morpheus is like, "What do you want?" Neo's like. You know, chicken wire fences. <laughs> <laughs> Morpheus is like, you don't want guns, Neo? No, no. What I need is like red barrels and wooden crates. And all right, that's kind of weird. But I mean, it, it, but you could you could really quickly get in there, and whatever the game design flavor of the week was, you could be like, all right, here are the fences I can make it over. Oh, I can't make it over fence D. You know, and here are the crates that are going to serve as cover. Or here's the here's the building height that works that I can jump between. And oh. And I can't make it between, you know, E and, and F or whatever. And it was uh, it was it was pretty helpful. And then uh, who really appreciated it was our animation guys. They could go in there and without having to like load up the game and make a character and log in and everything, just go through the whole rigmarole of logging into an MMO. They could just load up this this uh, gymnasium and just test all their acrobatics out and all the crazy animations that they did and make sure they all worked and you know going from point to point and even if they wanted to just get in there with two characters and just do their their fighting style so 
I, I agree with the uh, having some kind of vanilla Sandbox. space that you just drop everything in and just you know play around with it because more than the level designers will get uh, f uh, functionality out of that. In fact, uh, the World of Darkness one, uh, Dust didn't have one, but Global Agenda did have one where one side of this this playground was a shooting range complete with uh, range increments on it and everything. It almost looked like a like a golf driving range. You could just go in there and just be like, oh, this gun's good to about 100 meters, and yep. you know, this one. Yeah. So it was a, that's a, that's definitely a very good idea, and definitely get that going very early on in your game's development. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great segue into just general tools mm -hmm. for, um, I mean, the, the sort of playground slash measurement uh, sandbox mm -hmm. is, is a really important tool. Are there any other really important tools that you use for level design? Uh, I like having a blockout kit. Just having a um, complete gray mesh, it's, you have this whole package in your game engine that's just like ramps and blocks and cylinders yep. and just all, the, any, as many basic shapes as you can get that sort of represent game space with co tight collision. And I mean, theoretically you should be able to build an entire level out of that. I mean, sometimes you just have existing art and you do that, like we do that a lot because we're you know, a two person team. So. Yeah on that particular part of the game so it's we don't have time to we'll say all right we a tree's gonna go you should just put a tree there we have trees it's the prettiest placeholder you ever yeah. saw <laughs> and uh i guess making sure it's all on the grid that's that mm -hmm. <laughs> always work on the grid it'll save you so much time it, it seems tedious and it's, it's a pain in the butt but it'll it'll save you in the end <laughs> if you just remember yes. to do that yeah Having the nice corner yeah. pivots on your blockout <laughs> set and everything snaps together nicely. You turn off that grid checkbox and it's like, oh yeah, just line it up, yep. whatever. <laughs> it's going to be a nightmare later. Yep. Definitely a blockout tool set. My, my favorite engine is uh, is UDK. I like Unreal 4. Uh, <clears throat> Unity is, is all right. I mean, there are certain, in my personal experience, I don't know about you guys, but there's, you know, the three big game engines that are out there. Uh, Unreal is definitely, like, the level designer's game engine. Like, LDs tend to love it, and a lot of other people tend to hate it in, in game development. The the Cry engine is, artists usually love that one, because everything looks so pretty in it, but everybody else hates it. And then Unity, in my experience, all the programmers are like, yeah, Unity, oh, let's get in there in Unity and program. <laughs> and I sit down with it as a level designer, and I'm like, oh, does everything work? I don't understand. Where's my BSP? I feel so helpless without my clay. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, um, the, the tool set that lets you block things out fast. If your engine doesn't have it, get a plug-in or get an engine that has it, because the faster I can block something out, the faster I'm going to know if it's crap or if it's a genius. And then I can either throw it away or we can move forward with it. Whereas if I'm building things in, even if it's a placeholder art, that's more time it's finding that art, waiting for it to get made, putting it all in. And then, you know, I might waste days on something that we all sit down and look at and be like, that is crap. We mm -hmm. should, we, we should have stopped that days ago. Like I could have told you that this massive level was a terrible idea. So I made it back in a global agenda. I made a level that was a huge boat, and it was like, you know, in my mind, it was just brilliant. Yeah, everybody's gonna like on this oil tanker. They're gonna fight their way, and we all looked at it. And we're like, no, that's that's garbage. <laughs> that's, that's total garbage. Yeah, I think um, what we've run into um, from a tool standpoint, uh, we'll we'll have questions here in a bit. We'll hold. So, like. Blocking out your level, putting in your BSP for shapes where buildings could be. What's a BSP? <laughs> What's a BSP? Uh, BSP is the clay, clay or yeah. basic shapes that come in like Unreal. There you go. <laughs> Wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We totally knew what it meant. We yeah. Didn't yeah. Episode five. No, it was. I, what, I, what I know is. Down to you or anything. <laughs> <laughs> what I know. What I know is it is like like you were saying it's. A great tool set to have um, when you're blocking out a level, like when we're blocking out levels, Matt said we're a two-man team, so we can't spend forever trying to get stuff done. We have to make the most out of our time, mm -hmm. and I need to be able to get levels to Matt with very basic shapes describing the flow of the game, uh, different heights that are going to be in the map. Um, my, my best with BSP, if there's specific objects that eventually need to get made, what they could possibly look like, and so that, that would be blocking out. Yeah, you're just using basic primitives, like squares and rectangles and circles and cylinders to make the level instead of making a bunch of art 
and then wait, waiting for that final art to be in your game to start making levels. Have you seen a, there's a game on Steam called Minimum? It's like a shooter. It's, it looks like everything's just made out of white boxes. That's, yeah, that's like they were blocking out a game and then like all their artists like died in a bus accident. Or something. <laughs> they were just like, oh man, we've got this brilliant game all blocked out. And they were like, ah, oh, screw it. Just change the name and ship it. And, yeah. uh, oh, whatever. Man. It's called Minimum. Look, there's yeah. no art. It's, it's artsy. Yeah. Boy, you don't get it? Yeah. Come on. That's but, like you, you might actually hear people say like white boxing or gray yeah, boxing yeah. games that's they're block or blocking out they're all mm -hmm. kind of the same thing because you'll be using white boxes a lot of times mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um, I was gonna uh, one of the things that we've seen before uh, with level design tools as well is make a level that's good for marketing and like taking marketing shots or doing little animated gifs mm -hmm. of your character's abilities or things like that. Like, I know we, we did a MOBA pretty recently, and you know we wanted to just make these dead simple graphics of people killing little enemies with their powers. And the normal board was just a little too busy. So we ended up just making this yep. dead simple level for you to kill all these poor minions. Um, so, but uh, that's that's been a pretty good lesson too. Like, just be, be aware of all the marketing material you're going to need. We did, we did that, we called it the, uh, the visual target level. And that was like the, uh, for World of Darkness, that was just like uh, one intersection, the few you know really nice looking buildings, and then basically it was the simplest level design. There was no gameplay, or, and it was just this isolated little thing. And just all the envir environment artists would just throw their A game at it. And it, it did not run at all in the game. Like you could not log into it, you would, your machine would just explode. But it was just absolutely stunning gorgeous. And that's, we would use it for exactly what you said. It was like, hey, we need to have like a little trailer video or something to show off at, uh, at, at FanFest or something. And they would just throw their best looking characters into that, set up the camera angle just right. And you know, it wasn't any gameplay. The animators would just script out something and we'd get these beautiful shots in it. Yeah, we'll kind of do a, a similar thing we, where we'll we just, just got done doing one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a sub level, like add, it's basically like a level layer where you can turn it on and off yeah. and we'll, have like a screenshots level, but it's using our gameplay scene, but I can just put like a ton of extra grass yeah. and trees and stuff that mm. would never run at more we, like um, 10 FPS and then turn it off when I'm done taking we screenshots. We just got done showing the one that we just made for that exact purpose yeah. uh, yesterday yeah. in the investors conference that we went to in the morning uh, right. that we've been using to show. Exactly you can have, that, wit you can have that Witcher scandal where people are showing like, this is what you showed us. <laughs> yeah. Where's, Where's all the grass, guys? Where's all the grass? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. That's, that's the kind of thing. But he's they're totally right this is something that you should really invest in um it's we it was a great idea we just got done doing ours it was awesome we've got a it's really a good, good reception from it and yeah. um yeah yeah I mean, it, it's hard, and I think a lot of I think a lot of those kind of mistakes they come from a really good place. They come from a bunch of developers who are really enthusiastic. And generally, when you're working on um, a game, you're you're not working on it in the uh, final context of the game. So you you know, for example, you might be working on a multiplayer game, and you're building this level, and it's gorgeous. And like when you run around it all by yourself, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. But then when you dump like 15 other models in there, all of a sudden it doesn't run anymore, right? And so, um, when you play it on your machine at work, which is you know, right, very high tw spec. 20 cores and like yeah. a million <laughs> RAM and it like, works shipping, you know, all that so, stuff. <laughs> yeah, it totally works. And then. It's it's. I think it's really difficult because you 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 want like the best game you can make, but the problem is you never have the final context of the game till the mm -hmm. final game, right? And you don't want to limit yourself and be like, well, I'm going to make this look crappier than I can because it might be above target specs six months from now. So um, I don't know. I, I, I wish we could just sort of educate users, right? And be like, we tried really hard. It's not going to work out. This is what we wanted yeah. it to be, but it's not going to quite be that, you know? Um, and, and nobody wants to come out and say like, hey, your choice was the game has really great looking fire in all the sconces and runs at 20 frames a second yeah. or the game has uh, okay looking fire and runs at 40 frames a second like nobody wants to say that to their their customers but 
that's a pretty easy decision to make, right? Because whether or not your something looks good or some little bits and pieces are missing here or there from comparative screenshots is a lot different than, hey, this game runs at half the frames per second you said it was and doesn't even work on this whole slew of lower end machines. That's a that's a scandal. Some missing assets that's rel relatively minor. Yeah, so I don't know if there's a great answer. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that brings up another point that performance constraints and kind of knowing mm -hmm. those in advance is so yeah. important for any art side or, or design even too. I mean, it dictates everything. I mean, yeah. sometimes you might have a perfect level, but you have to purposely just put line of sight blocking and occlusion, yep. things that block the player from being able to see around it So because it doesn't render what's behind it. And you just have to do that, even though you're like, oh, this kind of ruins this perfect flow I had. You had these nice little figure eights I had, and I have to put a freaking skyscraper right here so you yeah. can't see the, all the other thousand models behind that. And it's, it's tough. You're always bound by the mighty frame rate. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so I want to leave time for uh, questions. So uh, I'm going to, uh, well, I think we have enough time. So tell me generally, like, what are some quicks, like, do's and don'ts or like pet peeves you have about level design like that other people do that you're like I'm never going to do that it's oh, like man. boring straight paths that, that yeah. always irritates yeah. me yeah. and not working on the grid mm. is always a huge yeah. one too because you open someone else's level they didn't work on the grid and you're just like oh, okay, I can't fix any of it um, bad collision from artists when they just like YOLO on the art and give it to yeah. you and you know, <laughs> you're just like well what this collision doesn't make sense you run into it and it throws you into the air um, um, good good figure eights good level flows always nice too I would say getting almost like I would say really high end critique on when you're gray meshing when you're just throwing in shapes and you're trying to like figure out the flow of your level and get it right and I, sometimes you'll have artists come in and mm -hmm. be like Whoa, 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 wait, how can this, this is all not going to work, and, and, and how are you going to have it? And I'm like, this, this is purely us playing around right now. This isn't set in stone yet. Um, that can be kind of frustrating because it kind of, for me, you know, throws off the design aspect a little bit. I know I do that to you sometimes. <laughs> I know. I'm like, put the mountains on <laughs> the shapes. <on. laughs> um, not, not working on the grid is another one. Mm. And then um, yeah, that's, that, that's pretty much it. Otherwise, you know, I like to say pretty open. So do you mean pet peeves about like what other people at a studio might do to you as a level designer or like, <laughs> what, what, or like <laughs> levels that are exist in games that I think either, suck either because one. of specific reasons? Okay, well, two, two of them. Okay, here's one that applies to both. I hate when, uh, when it's either intentionally or arbitrarily or just knee-jerk designed that, that there's going to be darkness everywhere, all right? Now, I know I worked on World of Darkness for a while, so that was, yeah, like, the whole game. It's there was, about like, a whole world of it. Yeah, there was, a whole, there was this whole world of it, and it was almost awesome. But uh, that one, I mean, the game, it's about vampires, so obviously it takes place at night, so you're just kind of, you're stuck with it there. We lit it up as much as we could, but I really, I can't stand playing games or designing games or trying to build a game where it's like, this game's going to be pitch black and, like, nobody's gonna see anything and it's like how do you how do you level design for that like it's, I just I'm gonna feel like I'm I'm doing that like stumble around in the darkness between the bed and the bathroom at three in the morning where you're just like where is everything in my house again like except it's unfamiliar and you're just gonna be you know bumping into my wife's garbage everywhere I'm just sorry this is like <laughs> therapy for me I apologize to everybody there but it's just like I, I just I can't stand the, the darkness everywhere and it's been like that on, on a few other games that I've worked on too where I've just been constantly like I'm the warrior of the light I'm the one who's always <laughs> like no it needs to be brighter You're like increase all the light sources that the player can have and like just because it's nighttime doesn't need, mean it needs to be pitch black that was my first experience with uh, and here's a, a, a real game uh, Day Z back before it was its own game it was the, the Arma mod right and everybody at ccp was like oh this game's so hardcore you know it's survival and the first three times i tried to play this game you know and every like all my friends are playing it too which is like that's like the easiest way to get into a game right all your friends are playing it. this should have been like shooting fish in a barrel right zombies all my friends are playing let's get in and go the first three times i jump into this game it's nighttime and it is just like my monitor's off, right? Like I'm just like, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, is my monitor on? It's just absolute pitch black, and it just like, oh, I can hear footsteps. I guess I'm in the game, right? So when do we? When was the game part of this? I feel like I'm just stumbling around in the darkness, and then like, wait, I thought I heard a zombie. Oh, I'm dead. Like that was that was it, and like, like hours would pass like that, and it's just like, 
how are you guys so into this game? That's what, every time I have one of those sliders where it's like, this game is atmospheric. Yeah. So adjust your darkness yeah. slider so you can only see the gray thing against the black background. I'm like, nope, yeah. all the way right, <laughs> right as possible. Yeah. All the way up, and then I'm like, gamma. Yeah. Take my gamma up to Hulk levels here. Yeah. <laughs> I can see everything. All right, so uh, I want to leave time for questions. So briefly, what to you makes truly great level design? Everything we just said. <laughs> yeah. Everything. If you've been paying attention. Um, no, I, I would say what truly, what truly makes great level design is if you take the time to study the kind of level that your game needs and you can put in the kind of interactions that will have players having a good time, um, want them coming back for more, and keep them interactive, then you pit good level design. If you can... Uh, and this is going to mean something because I'm I'm a I'm primarily a writer. Uh, if you can tell me a story without making me read anything, that's that's good for a, from a narrative standpoint. From a from just sort of a general game design and a multiplayer standpoint, I would say replayability is your is your barometer there. If I can play in the same map in like a multiplayer setting just over and over and over again, I never get sick of it or never feel like I'm exploiting or being exploited and never get bored of it then that's a really good level. And if you have a single-player game with a level in it that I just do not mind playing over and over again, that's a really good level. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a little element to this question. Yeah. I'm going I'm to tell you what my favorite level of all time is, right? It's uh, in the DLC for Mass Effect 2. If anybody's familiar with that, there's a level where you go to, it's called the Shadow Broker's Lair. Oh, yeah. And it's on a, it's on like a ship that's like in this Jupiter-like planet and it's gotta stay like on the day-night line of the planet. And so you're on this like, you know, it's this like sci-fi ship and you go inside of it and outside of it. So like you're constantly being exposed to the weather or you're back inside. And it's just like this, like the atmosphere of Jupiter is just raging around you. And like, so it's very distracting what's going on around you, but then you're fighting guys on the ship and it just, it's a static level, just like every other level, but it just it gives you that feeling that the the whole thing is moving. So you're kind of you're nervous and tense, and you get and the edges of it do a uh, they don't go straight and then like oh I can walk to the edge and just kind of casually look down. They do that nerve wracking nightmare fuel like <laughs> slow slope to the edge. <laughs> you guys remember uh, the first World of Warcraft expansion when you go to Outland and the world's all crumbly. And it never just went like, oh, a sheer cliff. It was like, oh, how far can you go before physics <laughs> takes over? You're, ah, you're going to fall off. It was, uh, you know, you never quite knew where your boundaries were on it. I mean, you knew you were going to die, but you never knew how far you could go. And uh, for me, that's just, you know, it's atmospheric, tells a story without any words. I never mind replaying it. If that were a multiplayer map, I think it would probably be pretty fun. It's not symmetrical, but anyway, that's my, that's my favorite map of all time. Yeah, and I th my mine kind of dovetails into Nathan's, which is... I, I, I think you, if you can make a level that has like these really magic moment-to-moment -moment mm -hmm. gameplay stories that you want to tell your friends, and then when you tell your friends, they know exactly where it happened, mm -hmm. right? Like the level lives in their mind in mm -hmm. such a way that it's just as real as like you know their own kitchen, right? Yeah. Like they know it that well. Um, I think you know <coughs> Halo has a lot of great levels like that. You know, we're like, oh, you know, I I went up, you know, that one purple uh, like slope, and I like threw a sticky. You know, oh yeah, I know exactly where that mm -hmm. is. You know, like that to me is just fantastic. Um, do you guys have any closing words so we can open it up to questions? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. All right. Questions. Um, questions? Yes, sir. Um, so the the yeah, thank you for reminding us. So the question is, how can you tell when to when to uh, place basically basically meaningful emptiness into a level? Um, I would say, you know, first off, there's a lot of technical reasons that happens, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times you're loading stuff, you just don't know it. Um, 
But I think it creates tension and it creates a lull, right? So like if you've been fighting a bunch of stuff, you can put those sort of lulls before a boss fight, right? Because mm -hmm. it's kind of like that anticipation of death is scarier than death itself kind of thing. So anytime you want to build, uh, you know, anticipation is, I think, a good way to do it. I would say if you were if you were making a flow chart of when to include massive wide open spaces in your game, it would be, does your game have vehicles? Yes or no? You should probably have some wide open spaces. We ran into this on Dust514 a lot. We had some maps that had some like choke points and bases going through and we were like, yeah, this feels perfect for run and gun style gameplay. And then somebody tried to drive a tank through it and you know get caught up in all the stuff and it's like, oh crap, I forgot we've got tanks in this game too. That's not gonna work. Uh, the second is, does your game have uh, any long-range effects or weaponry? You, you got a sniper rifle in your game? Guess what? You probably don't want to be indoors running around like tight corners all the time or that guy's going to feel completely gimped. And then uh, the last one is, uh, how good is or how important is the, uh, the art and the ambiance for your game? Because there are games that it just, it kind of really, like Doom and Quake and all those, like it has art, but there's never really this big set piece reveal. Like you don't, you never played through Doom and we're like, whoa, look at this amazing <laughs> Vista shot of, of whatever, you know, but if you're making a game like, uh, like Skyrim or something, there's definitely points where, all right, when you come out of this dungeon or when you come out of the, uh, the vault for the first time in, in Fallout 3, we got to have this, this money shot here of like the, the hills and the ruined buildings and, you know, we're setting the, the color scheme and, you know, you can see all the stuff not moving and it's a, just a dead landscape. So I would say those are the three big things. Like know your game design, know the scale and scope of what's going on in your level. And then uh, if you have any really big art budget things that you need to get across, like the, the tree you were talking about was probably like, oh, we've got all this gameplay going in it, but I want it to be like this really big, impressive thing to look at too. So. That's the flowchart. Yes. Um, a lot of what you talked about um, involved 3D games. Mm -hmm. So what are more like specifically 2D type game level design? So <coughs> everything I'm talking about is definitely. So the, the question was, we've been talking about a lot of 3D games. What are th some things specifically for 2D games? Um, I have worked almost exclusively on 2D games. So. Um, I would say all the things that we've talked about still apply, like blocking out levels still totally applies, you know, um, these micro and macro uh, approaches to level design, the, like even the, you know, long spaces of nothingness, like that totally applies to 2D design. So um, I think pretty much everything we've talked about, you know, the only, the only thing that like we really, have talked about, I think that doesn't apply is sort of like that line of sight yeah. problems because you don't have to worry about that in as much in 2D design, but you still have a, sort of a camera in 2D mm -hmm. design. You always have to be very mindful of what the player is actually going to see. You know, if you're placing your, you're doing your level design like this, you have to be aware that they're only going to see this. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I think pretty much all this stuff still applies to 2D. Yeah, one of one of my teams that I'm on just shipped uh, Edge of Space, which is like the uh, 2D Terraria style uh, build explorer game, and uh, yeah, that inability to just pick a direction and look and see all the way to the horizon or what your next objective is, uh, you can only see this much of, of this big of a map, and then uh, just uh, the 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 shapes that you have to play with. It's like, uh, I'm gonna do another Futurama reference. Remember when they, uh, they crashed their ships together and they were stuck in the 2D world and it was like, oh, here are things that aren't gonna work because we're only in a 2D world. Like we can't just kind of pass each other like that. I mean, even in a 2D game, you could probably pull that off, but it's just, it's something to be aware of that if you're gonna be moving things over each other, you're gonna lose some comprehension at that point. Like if my character is gonna walk behind something, now I've lost sight of them. Or if my enemies can move over each other, I've lost, my, my brain has momentarily lost track of how many enemies there are on the screen. So it's just more things to plan for. You just, you've, I mean, you've literally lost that dimension. So you have to, you have to account for it in some other way. But uh, I'd say everything, everything gets brought really in on the character in 2D. I can't just, my field of vision is no longer this big cone that I can see as far as I want. 
but on the positive side, on a 2D game, I can see all around my character. It's not like a first-person game or even a third-person game where I can just see like a little bit behind me. I can see if somebody's right behind me, but it depends on where the camera is. In a 2D game, I can see all around me. So for better or for worse, for better in that the player is going to be like, oh, nothing's really going to be able to sneak up on me from really close. But for worse in that now I'm worried about all of the clutter and stuff that's going on around me, not just not just what I can see. So you can you can really play with that uh, to play with the character, the player's emotions. Um, sorry, go ahead. Yes. What's a game uh, well designed gimmick that you're just really hard to see? So the question is, what is a game design gimmick that we are tired of seeing? That's a good question. Um, so I'm, this, this is specifically to me, uh, for, so I work for Cartoon Network and we make a lot of kids games and, um, it would just be double jumping. I, I have a hatred for double jumping, um, because here's the thing, kids cannot double jump and, and when people make kids games with double jump, I want to choke them. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, nah. you know my answer to that darkness. <laughs> Stop making your games pitch black. You know, they do that in, in Hollywood films all the time. If, if, if it's really dark, it's either a horror movie or they're trying to cover up low budget CG. Like that's, that's when they use the darkness, you know, like we're, we're watching the, the Godzilla movie and they're like, why are these monsters always fighting at night? Well, it's, it kind of blurs the edges a little bit there. You don't, you don't notice when they left stuff out or left it rough. To touch a touch similar to Nathan's uh, e completely evenly lit maps where it's like gameplay yeah. is so important we can't have lighting just put a skylight in and we're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Evenly lit maps or not. Uh, more questions? I'll go way over here. <clears throat> so what are some level design mistakes that we have made in the past? I, I can say size. Like making mm -hmm. a level too big or too small. Um, that was probably one of the first things I really had to learn was figuring out mm -hmm. the right size for the right kind of map for the gameplay that we were yeah. looking for. Put your reference man in. Work, <laughs> work around him. So yeah. it, it, when you're blocking out a level, one of the things that you'll do is either grab one of the character models, like when it, just in a T-pose, or just grab something for scale and just sort of like leave it around in your map as you're working. Every time you make a door, just kind of make sure he can slide through it. You know, every time you're making a room, just say, is this, is this like an airplane hangar or is this like a closet? You know, just kind of leave that guy there all the time. Cause I've definitely done the same thing where I'm like, <laughs> yeah. this map is gorgeous. And then we go in and you feel like you're, you know, like you're Alice in Wonderland. Like what? Um, Everything's so yeah. enormous. It, it's another reason that we created the, the matrix room map because mm -hmm. uh, things like sizing, sizing mm -hmm. or yeah. running, you know, how long does a character need to run? Cause I've definitely made some maps. And I'm like, this is going to be awesome. And I'm like, well, it takes forever it to takes get where you want to go. It takes two minutes yeah. to get to the center. <laughs> uh, you, sometimes you just get a little lost in your design because you're like, oh, it has to be here and here, and it looks yeah. perfect. So yeah, sizing is definitely yeah. one of the mistakes I've made. Yeah, I'd say um, on 2D level designs, a mistake that I've made a million times is uh, accidentally making leaps of faith where like you'll get to the edge of a platform and like you, there's nothing. You're like, I have no idea where to go. I'll jump off. I'm dead. Um, so, you know, whenever you work on 2D games, you need to be super aware of the, what the camera, what you can see, what the character can see in the, in the camera. Um, you can certainly offset that with um, little signs on the background that say skull and crossbones this mm -hmm. way, or you can add pickups in a jump arc or something like that. Um, but I, it's, you know, I work with a lot of external vendors and I, that, that is probably the number one like 2D level design mistake. Uh, more questions? Oh, we're at time. Okay, so last question. Um, so you guys mentioned lighting, or you guys mentioned darkness a lot, and lighting is kind of a big deal. So for level design, often in a professional setting, does the level designer do the first art pass, or do the first lighting pass, mm -hmm. generally? So, oh. oh, sorry, it was kind of a two part. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I forgot to say that. But the other real thing is, how much does that affect your design? Okay, so the question was, we've talked a lot about lighting, so does the level designer have like a first pass on lighting and how does that affect level design? Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, I normally do my first pass, and then uh, I'll hand it off to, to Matt, and he'll come in, and he'll do a second pass, and then even sometimes we'll go to like a third or a fourth pass so we get it exactly where we think it needs to be. And as far as lights and levels, at least for our game, and I would imagine many of them, it's important to think about where your lights are going to be because mm -hmm. you need to think about where your shadows are going to be. You need to think about um, how that affects the level. Uh, for example, if you have a character that can shoot like we do and we have a sun coming up over the mountain and a person has to face that, I mean, they've got this bright light in their face now, whereas the other guys mm -hmm. <laughs> away from that can use that to their advantage because now they can't see where they're shooting. And um, like you were saying before, mm -hmm. you don't want to level completely in shadows and darkness. It's, nope. it's nice when they're really specific, when you, you are making spaces that people can specifically hide in and stuff like that. So I think light's really important to think about when you're building. Yeah, that, that's what uh, I think a level designer should do is, uh, you know, when you're, when you're blocking out the map, I just like to have like the skylight and then maybe one shadow caster in there just so I don't like get that weird 3D vertigo, like you've been playing Tetris too long when you're looking at your map. Uh, and then I'll build the whole map, but I'll sort of have in my mind's eye, like, oh, this room is gonna be, you know, like the, the generator's down, so this room's gonna be kind of lights off, and here's outside, and it's sunset, so it's gonna be like lit like this, and then here's an objective with spotlights around it. So I, you know, I kind of know what that's gonna be like, and then when I'm done with the blockout and we're happy with that, I'll go back in and I'll do like a, kind of a first, like pass 1B on the lights, where kind of brighten it up and darken it where it needs to be but usually then once it's once the map is sort of physically nailed down then it goes off to somebody who knows what the hell they're doing with lights and they make it look all gorgeous and then and then i put it in my portfolio and i'm like hey this, is, this amazing looking map that i made and everybody's like oh, okay next for multiplayer a lot of times you have to do end up doing like 90 degrees to the objectives because it's symmetrical mm -hmm. which kind of is it binds art because sometimes art directors want to say like, all right, I want it to be dusk, so the yeah. sun needs to be sitting behind these things. But then you're like, well, it's symmetrical, and like you said, there's sunlight on one. So you end up being like, well, the objectives are here, my light has to be here, so it's balanced. And, and it, it's, they do they do that in uh, in sports arenas like football stadiums and stuff. <laughs> they have to face north south so that it's not like a crazy advantage depending on when you play. Right to, to the rock paper scissors point mm -hmm. that you were doing before, you can't be like, oh well, you know, we have a sniper up here, but then they're all of a sudden they've got sunlight in their yeah. eye and you can't see anything, so now you just ruin that spot that you mm -hmm. designed. So it it can be tricky. Yeah. Well, great, we're already over time, but yeah. uh, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks.